Thank you for all being here, and it's good to see you tonight. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Isaiah 40. And we're going to stay there the whole time and let Isaiah do the heavy lifting here through one of his sermons, which may be one of his most famous sermons, too, here in chapter 40. Uh, If you don't know the beginning, by the time we read the end, you're going to, oh, oh, I know this chapter. Isaiah 40 makes the bold claim that the word of the Lord endures forever. Um, And many of us know that phrase, maybe not necessarily from Isaiah 40, but we know it from the epistle of 1 Peter, where he quotes Isaiah 40 and says that the word of the Lord endures forever. And Isaiah explores that here in chapter 40. Uh, When you put that in context, in the context that Isaiah is going to put it in, he's using it in a sense of a comparison that really nothing else in existence endures forever, but God's word has endured forever. And that really sets it apart from everything else. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, I was reading an article, and an article a guy wrote about another article someone wrote in 2012. In 2012, there was this article floating around the internet. It was a conspiracy theory. Maybe some of y'all have heard of it. But the article was called, The Internet is Dead. (laughs) And it it was a conspiracy theory. It went way too deep in different ways. But they were just making the argument that the internet near isn't as useful as it used to be. Um, And then this guy took this article and he said, that may have actually been kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy because we've seen that happen in our own days. I think about just my time of being alive where we've had the internet. And the internet, especially in terms of just web browsing, used to be really helpful. Uh, You could Google something and you could find an answer. I remember being very little and having a question about something. We were trying to figure something out and dad like went to the office, right? And got out the computer and we Googled it and we found an answer. But nowadays, many of you probably have noticed, you'll Google something, will you find the answer? You got to wade through so much garbage, you may never find the answer. Uh, several weeks ago, me and my little brother were trying to fix something, and we both Googled it, and we could not find a single article that fixed it. Instead, we found thousands of bot-written articles saying the same thing over and over again and never actually saying anything, right? And wading through that garbage, you just can't find the stuff that you used to be able to find. Many of you ladies, you may have Googled recipes. Oh, I've cooked this before. I I need to remember what the recipe is. How are you able to find the recipes anymore? No, you'll go to a website, and what do you do? You scroll through a thousand-page essay some bot wrote about their family cooking this meal, and maybe at the very bottom there will be the recipe. But there's just so much trash on the Internet now and so much garbage. I'm not necessarily talking about sinful things. I'm just talking about useless things. That it's just not as useful as it used to be. And they made the point that maybe the Internet will die. Well, looking all through history, and even what the Bible claims to be, is the internet going to remain the way it is for all time? No, it's not. Everything that man has made, does it endure forever? No, it does not endure forever, does it? And if Sears, the giant corporation of America that has existed since 1870, if Sears will go under, Will the internet one day just not be very useful when people will stop using it? Yeah. You know, that's the way the world works. Now, that's everything that we've made, but what does Isaiah make the bold claim of? He says the word of God endures forever. And and that's just something you can't find anywhere else. So let's go through Isaiah 40, and we'll pull some of that themes out as we read through this chapter. I'm going to try something different. I'm going to give you my outline first. And then I want to read secondly, and at least then when we'll read, you'll be looking for what I'm going to highlight. As Isaiah begins, he makes the point that Jerusalem has been punished, and maybe this is futuristic, maybe this is Sennacherib's invasion, we're not 100% sure, but Jerusalem has been punished. Now that Jerusalem has been punished for their sin, it's time for Jerusalem to be comforted. And this is going to be the comforting message of God through Isaiah to Jerusalem now that their sins have been forgiven. And the message is this. Prepare the way of the Lord. He's coming. He's on his way. Make his path straight. The Lord's glory will be visible to all. And that's what we'll read here in the first five verses. Verse 1 of Isaiah 40 says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert 
a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So we get verse one and verse two. Here's a comforting message. The comforting message there begins in verse three. The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, right? Prepare the way of the Lord. And I know for many of us, we just read that. Where did our mind go to? We went to John the Baptist. And certainly we can go to Isaiah 40 and we can pull out John the Baptist and we can pull out the apostles and we can pull out Jesus. And certainly this is a prophecy of John the Baptist. But if we would just look at it for what it's worth here, I think there's also a very interesting message. The message is, is that the Lord's on his way, right? And as he's on his way, it's our job, or at least the people's job here, to make a landing strip. That's the way that I think of it. That here, you know, he's on his way. What do we need to do? We need to clear away in the desert. We need to clear away in the wilderness so he can actually land. Verse four, I think, has some very interesting imagery, right? Every valley shall be exalted. What does that mean? That all the low places would get higher. And then the next slide, every mountain will be brought low. So what's going to happen to the mountains? they're going to be brought to the same level of the valleys, right? The crooked places, the place where it winds, those are going to be made straight. If we were able to get our environment, which we're really not, but if we're able to get our environment and raise the valleys and lower the mountains and straighten the crooked places, what would we be doing? We would be making everything what? Visible, right? That, that's the concept. Everything can be seen if we you know, moved all these things straight and level. And now I could see for miles. In Alabama, you can't see for miles, can you? You can see about 50 feet in every direction and then you're covered in trees and you don't see a thing. But there's other places in this world that are empty and flat. And what can you do? You can see for miles. But what's the importance of doing all these things? It's that last line. So the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. The first context we could take from this is that John the Baptist is going to prepare the Israelites for Jesus, and he's going to make things so that in that environment, the Lord's glory will be better revealed. They'll be ready for Jesus. They'll be interested in Jesus. And when he finally arrives, well, now he's visible. He's visible for all to clearly see. But as well, I think for like modern application, we could take it this way. There are things that we can do to prepare the way of the Lord. There are things that we can do to clear some things out to give the Lord a little bit more room to grow, can't we? And sometimes that's managing just like our time, where I can think to myself, okay, I need to be better, closer to the Lord. I need to have better fellowship with the Lord. What are some things I can do with my calendar so that I can do those things, right? You know, maybe it means not going to work on Sunday. Maybe it means setting some time to have a Bible study. Maybe that means, you know, actually just making time for our family or whether it's making our time for our brethren whatever it could be, right? What am I doing there if I'm removing other things so I can have more time for God? Well, I'm making and preparing a way for the Lord, aren't I? Also, I thought the context could be like, you just got to get people where they actually can take and eat Jesus and take him for what he is. I think probably a lot of us are very good readers. I imagine that we all in this room can read, but not everyone in this world can read, can they? If you took the time to try to teach someone how to read, would that help them prepare the way for the Lord? Yeah, that way they could read the books, couldn't they? Does everybody have really good reading comprehension ability? I, there's some of us that we'll read a passage and we got it, right? Or we'll read anything and we've got it in our mind. It's locked in. But a lot of us just aren't built that way. We've never had to do it. We don't have to do it usually. We'll read a passage a hundred times and, and it won't go anywhere. What I have found to do sometimes with people like that is as helpful if someone else will read it to them. And if they can listen to it being read instead of having to read it themselves, they'll comprehend what's being said a little bit better. What could we generalize all those things as? Those is preparing the way for the Lord, isn't it? Now, certainly not on the level John the Baptist did, but it certainly would be helpful. And if God's on his way, there are some things we can do so that the Lord's glory would be visible to everyone. And there's those first five verses. Now I'm here in verse six, we get, I think, to our meat. Verse six and eight, God's gonna tell Isaiah, I need you to cry out. So if God comes and tells you to cry out, what's gonna be all of our first response? 
it's going to be, Lord, cry out what, <laughs> right? You know, hey, go tell the message. Well, what is the message? And then God gives them the message. And the message is, is that a human's lifespan is like grass. But as you know, but God's word is forever. Read here with me in verse six. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And in all its loving, loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The thought is here is that there's a message, and here's the message. And this message, of course, works for the people in the days of Isaiah, and obviously it works for a Christian audience too because Peter quoted it to a Christian audience. But here's the message. The message is, is that you're mortal, and I'm mortal too. When God looks at our lives, it's comparable to like the life of grass. You know, some of y'all, you know, you got your yard, you do the best you can with your yard, but in the springtime, what happens? You know, some of those grassy weeds grow up higher, and what do they produce? They produce dandelions, <laughs> and you get these little yellow flowers right all over your lawn. Well, how long is that going to last? Well, some of us are like, oh, I'll just last a month and they'll be gone. I won't have to worry about it, right? I think that's a fine approach if that's the approach you want to take it. But in within, you know, a couple of months, that grass flowers is dead and then it's just grass and it's probably going to last until about the fall and then it's going to be dead. So how long did that grass last? Compared to your and my lifetime, we think that's just like a season. Like that's nothing. And it had a flower on it for a couple of moments, but that's about it. Can you see why God looks at our lives the same way as we look at grass? Like we're there, and then we have, you know, pretty flowers, and maybe we look kind of healthy, and we do pretty well, and then not very long, we start getting old, and we get older and older, and then we die. <laughs> and we're gone, right? We're mortal. We're not going to exist that very long. But what is that in comparison to? The Word of God endures forever. And, and we could have said... He could have said, you're going to die, but I'm not going to. We could have put there that God endures forever, but that's not what God put. God put the word of God endures forever, that just his message that he gave us, that's what's going to be internal in this consideration. It's interesting to think that some big events that we feel like happened a long, long time ago really weren't that long, long time ago. We think about the Civil War. And people will say quickly, well, the Civil War was a long, long time ago. But it really was just 175 years ago. You know, for me, that's my grandparents' grandparents. There's some people in this room right now, it was your grandparents. Your grandparents remember the Civil War. Was that that long time ago? When you think about it from that perspective, it really wasn't that long time ago. I mean, a lot of us go and dig in our backyards and we find bullets and cannonballs and stuff, don't we? Really wasn't that long time ago. And even though it really wasn't that long time ago, everybody that remembers it is what right now? Dead. Every single one of them is gone. And so that wasn't a long, long time ago, but every single person that could tell us about it is now dead and gone. What does God say we are? Our life is like grass. Now, I think what's more interesting with that is that when you read about the Civil War and you learn about the issues they were having to deal with and the morality questions, and they were trying to determine what God wanted them to do in those situations. What did they have to help them and guide them to make those decisions? It was the Word of God. And can you believe this? It was the same Word of God that you and me have in our hands right here. So what survived? God's Word survived. Did any of us survive? No, they're all gone. But God's Word still survived. And you can do that with anything in the past 2,000 years. You don't want to go to wars back in 300 AD and the Christians were having to make decisions about what's right and what's moral and what should they do. Guess what books they went to to help them figure those things out? It was the same books that you and me have in our hands right here. It's never gone away. Nations have fallen. People have fallen. But God looks at us and goes, but my message is still there. And what can we take from that even looking in the future? If the Lord allows us to continue to go on for a thousand years and, and people come and dig up our bones and our, dig up our civilization, 
What will they still have a thousand years from now, Lord willing? They'll still have the books, won't they? Because the books are here to stay. And it makes such a powerful point, even back in the days of Isaiah, that the God's word is going to endure forever. So hold on to this thought, and we can follow this theme all the way through the rest of the chapter. Read verse 9 through 11 with me now. Oh, no, let me do my outline first. I'm gonna, I was going to try this, and I think it may be helpful. He says here that it's time to spread this good news from Zion, that God's word is going to endure, and that there's something special that you're going to be able to get from it. And this is the message here, is that God is strong. But at the same time, it's not like he just has strong arms, but he's also good. And he's so good that he's even gentle with his young. So here in this little part, he talks sort of like this separate nature of God, that God's also a mighty person, but he also can be gentle when he needs to be gentle. Verse nine here, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength, lift it up and be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. The thought is here in verse nine is like, okay, do we have this message? And O Zion and O Jerusalem, it's your job to spread that message. When you just get back from John the Baptist prophecy, you can easily go to this prophecy and say it's the apostles that the apostles were going to be given the message on Zion and they were going to go and spread it out. And certainly that could be a prophecy for this. But this is the message here in 10 and 11, is that God is strong, right? He has strong arms. And, and then he turns in the next passage, doesn't he? He rules us, but verse 11, but he's also like a shepherd to his sheep. And he has arms there too, but what does his arms do? They don't strong arm people. Those arms gather his lambs. So you see the mighty God and the gentle shepherd in the same passage, and that's who God is. Can you think of a passage in Romans that perfectly really illustrates that? Doesn't Paul in Romans 11 say, consider the goodness and severity of God, that he's both? And I see that here too. This is who our God is, very mighty and strong, but also gentle, especially in that very last phrase there, verse 11 and gently lead those who are with young. You know, I think about, uh, I don't know. I don't mean to get emotional. I almost did. Ooh, glad I got rid of that. Uh, you no, know, you think about all the babies here now, and you think about all the people that are expecting babies. You know, what, is, what does even Isaiah say here about our God? That he's gently lead those who are with young. You know, the concept is a shepherd knows that some of his sheep have young with them. And do those mother sheep, do they get to run real fast with the herd? No, they, they got to be slow and they've got to be patient. And what does this shepherd understand? This shepherd understand that there's young, isn't there? And, and that the, these are things that they're going to have to demand some patience. It's going to demand some time. It's going to demand it's a little bit extra right? Does God understand all those things? Yes, he does, doesn't he? And he even considers those that are his that have young, and he has patience with them, and he's gentle with them. And that's certainly something very to be appreciative of, of who our God is. And so we, we get introduced to God here in 9 through 11, and then we get introduced to God's power in 12 through 17. When we get here, Isaiah brings up that big things are very little to God, that things that we think are just mighty and too big to be measured, God sees those things are very trivial and very little. You know, we cannot give him counsel because of that. We always get high and mighty and think, oh, I'm going to explain to God how this is going on, but that's just going to be a useless effort. And he wraps it up with, he's not very impressed with our nations, and he's never been really impressed with our nations. Now let's read here in verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and has calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance, who has directed the spirit of our Lord, or has his counselor has taught him, 
With whom did he take counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is sufficient to burn, nor is beast sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. Obviously, just talking about the might and the power of God. Verse 12 really brings out this, this imagery, and, and the imagery begins with, look, he measures the water with the hollow of his hand. What, is, what are we supposed to picture? You know, we're supposed to picture like, you know, sometimes we can cup water in our hands, right? And if you had a little brother, you'd always like, hey, come look at this, you know? But God, what does he do? He can measure all the waters like that in the hollow of his hand. It says then that he measures heaven with a span. And a span is like, we all know cubit, right? They use measure things in cubit. Well, span was the smaller version of the measurement and it was really just your hand. So all of heaven in the sky, what does God need to measure it with? Well, he can just measure it with his hand, like in a span. The next one, he calculates the dust of the earth. And I really think if we were going to use it for a modern day version, we would say in a measuring cup. <laughs> like, you know, he has like one of these old little plastic measuring cups that we keep at our house for some reason. And he can measure all of the dirt on the earth in his measuring cup, right? He weighs the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. But here's the mightiest things that we've ever seen. And God could pick that thing up and just measure it on a little weight scale. Like, okay, that's what that is, right? And he knows what these numbers are. He's too big. And since he's too big, then he asks the question in verse 13. You know, who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Who's been his counselor? Well, what's the answer to that question? No one has. You, you can't tell God what to do, Right? You can't advise God that he should do better in this area. You can't argue to God that, you know, God, I know you said this, but it really should be this. Because what's the point of arguing with a God that can measure all the dirt in a measuring cup? You know, what's the point of arguing with a God that can measure all the water in the hollow of his hand? He's too big. You, you can't tell him what to do, can you? You really just have to wait on him to tell you what to do. Who can taught him in the path of justice? You can't tell him what's righteous. He's already told us what's righteous, and there's no way for me to even argue a point to him. Verse 15, he says, Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket. That's how we would say it, right? My version says, or as a drop in a bucket. But a drop in the bucket. When do we use that expression? You know, maybe if you're at the grocery store or you're trying to check out somewhere, and the person in front of you is short a nickel, and you've got a nickel in your pocket. You know, you could, you could pull out your pocket and nickel and just say, hey, 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 there you go, take it. And then they turn to you and say, oh, thank you for that, right? And what could you reply back with? Oh, don't worry about it, just dropping the bucket. Do y'all use that expression? Okay, well, I use that expression. All right. Anyway, but what's the thought of a drop in the bucket? Drop in the bucket is like, this is nothing to me, right? It, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. It costs me nothing. It's like a drop in the bucket. Here's a nickel. Yeah. What are the nations to God? They're like a drop in the bucket. <laughs> He's like, don't worry about it. It's just, it's just useless. It's worthless, right? He counted them. He, there is nothing to him. They can't even provide enough for him if they want to make a sacrifice. They're useless. Isn't that crazy? I think about how warped we get about our nations. And don't get me wrong. You know, I love the concept of being part of a good nation. I love the concept of the peace and safety we get to enjoy. I love the concept of our prosperity. Those are things that absolutely we enjoy and we can thank God for it. But in the grand scheme of things, what are these nations to God? They're like a drop in the bucket. They're very temporary and they're very fickle and they do the job they're supposed to do and then one day he gets rid of them. Going back to the word of the Lord endures forever. You know how many nations that we've had over the course of 2,000 years? You couldn't count them. Like the amount of government changes and which kind of governments we have, they're all over the place, aren't they? And I know certainly a lot of them have kept their name, but every 500 years, the nation's government will could be completely different than the old government. We could just like look at England. Like it's always been called England, but 
every 500 years, their system of government is completely different because they have to radically change. They're not the same government they were 500 years ago. But even though the nations are constantly changing, what endures forever? The word of the Lord is enduring forever, isn't it? And it's never changed. Maybe that's why he looks at our nations as just a drop in the bucket. Please use that in a sentence this week and then uh, come and tell me. Let's read 40, 18 through 20. Here simply, he just says that the idol makers are pitiful and the poor idol makers are not much better. Verse 18, he says, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman molds his image. The goldsmith overspreads it with gold. And the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is in too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. The thought is, is that these idol makers are going out and they're making these gods with gold and silver. But he says, are these things even comparable to God? No, they're actually kind of pitiful in comparison to God. And he says, here's the poor man who doesn't have the money for such a contribution. He can't afford a gold or silver idol, so what's his best next thing? He just goes and finds a good board that isn't rotten. And he hires someone to craft him an idol out of that board. And what's the only condition there at the very end? That it doesn't totter. You know, that it never falls down. (laughs) As long as it has a good base and it'll stand up, that'll be my idol. Are these things in comparison to God? No, these things aren't even close as comparison to God. And that's where we really, really move into verse 21. In verse 21, he's like, have you not heard of God? And this, these parts here is where we get the song, Saints Lift Your Voices. All of this is out of this little section. He says, princes and judges try to plant roots of legacy. And they try to do things to make their power and their influence greater and longer. He says, but God can just uproot them with his breath. And then he ends it with this thought of how can you even be equal to the God that can count the stars or has made the stars and knows them all by name? Let's read now verse 21 through 26. He says, have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and his inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root on the earth. When he also will blow on them and they will wither. And the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then you will be likened to me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high to see who has created these things who brings out their host by number, who calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Verse 21 by there, have you not known? Have you not heard? That's where we get from saints, lift up your voices. Don't you know that from the beginning, God's created the foundations of the earth? You know, don't you know that God sits on the circle of the earth and the heavens are like a curtain to him and the inhabitants are like grasshoppers? But I think what's very special is this thought in verse 23. He brings the princes and the judges of this earth to nothing. And scarcely they try to plant, they try to sow, they try to establish roots. But God blows, and when he blows, they just fall away like they're nothing. And they're uprooted. I think there's a thought here that it's more than just forming. That the judges and the princes of this earth think they're powerful and they're mighty and they want to be influential. But God just steals all their thunder and all their glory all the time just because they can't exist. Who was the most wealthiest person that's ever lived? A lot of us could answer Solomon. I I think that'd be an okay answer. I think in terms of resources, Solomon did probably have unlimited resources. But just in terms of gold, and and as far as we know, who's owned the most gold or the most money ever, we, we think that was Augustus Caesar. Augustus Caesar was sort of the first emperor of Rome. He really should have been the first emperor of Rome. Uh, He called himself Divi Filius, the son of God. He built temples all throughout the empire that was about worshiping him because he was supposed to be the son of Venus, the son of Julius. There was even temples where Jesus ministered and taught. There would have been temples to Augustus there, right? This guy goes to war with the barbarians. He wins. He dies of an old age, comfortably and peaceful. He actually writes his own funeral 
sermon. <laughs> and he's like, this is what you're going to publish and read when I die. And boy, I'll tell you what, I've had to read it. And it is just like him talking about how wonderful and great he is and how he's just was the savior of Rome. Thought it would have been funny if, if I die, one of y'all could get up and just read Augustus's funeral. It would be funny. You know, here's a guy who, who's definitely in terms of mortal and, and human. As a human, he's the most powerful human that's ever existed. He's the wealthiest human that's ever existed. He's the most influential human that's ever existed. Did he try to plant roots? Oh, yeah, he did. Did he try to create a legacy to be remembered after he was gone? Yeah, he did. But if I ask any one of y'all who's the most famous person who died in the first century, who are you going to tell me? You're not going to tell me Augustus. You're going to tell me Jesus Christ. This poor carpenter that was born from Nazareth, right? So here's a guy that plants his roots, but the Lord blew and it came to nothing, didn't it? If that's going to be true for these two people, are we going to ever be able to create some long-lasting legacy on this earth? Like, are we going to be able to develop a company that's just going to, you know, stand the course of time? Are you and me going to be able to get together? Are we going to be able to build a family? that's just going to go on and on and be just such a good and powerful and wonderful family, and they're going to exist the course of time. And even take it this far, can all of us together create a local church that's going to exist the course of time? You know, the church of Ephesus, do they still exist? Their preacher was Paul. They don't exist anymore. Now, certainly the Christians in Ephesus, they still exist, and we believe that, that they've been saved and guarded in the universal church. But the, the concept of our working for a local church, is this place going to exist the course of time? No, it's not. But finally, again, what will exist the course of time? The Word of God will still be here, won't it? Because the Word of God endures forever. Let's keep on going now here to 27 through 28. He says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? Neither faints nor is weary. His understandings is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Uh, and all of y'all who thought, oh, I don't know Isaiah 40, you just dawned on you, oh, no, I do know Isaiah 40, right? Here at the very end, he says, if all of this is true, if God's word endures forever, if God is so mighty and powerful, then why do we as saints get the habit of saying God has forgotten about my issue? You know, I told God about this, but it hasn't been corrected, so God has must have forgotten about me. Well, he reminds us that this is a God that does not forget. This is a God that doesn't need sleep. This is a God that didn't get too exhausted to deal with it. That's not who our God is. And maybe we make the mistake of trying to associate our human relationships as if God has any type of relationship like we would have with another human. You know, if you order something, there's a good chance you're not going to get it. <laughs> Me and Emily ordered a couch like a year ago, and they told us it'll be there in six months. We're sorry it's going to take that long. A year later, I had to walk into the furniture place and grab by the throat and say, pay me what you owe, because I never got a couch. I didn't really do that. I was quoting the parable for you Bible students. Uh, you know, like, that they just, oh, we forgot, you know, you got lost in the system, right? You know, one time I ordered a dishwasher. It took them a whole year to get me that dishwasher. And they were like, oh, we lost it in the system. Sorry, they delivered three of them and all three of them were broke. Had to send them all back, right? Some of y'all have had to deal with like government things and you got audited and stuff like that. And you had to contact them and say like, why did I get audited? And they were like, oh, oh, we got lost in the system. We forgot, uh, we made a mistake. But you had to take all the brunt of the burden for it, right? We've all had experiences like that. Humans are like terrible at forgetting things. And usually we suffer because of it. What the Lord is saying here, don't take that attitude that we have towards each other and put that on God. 
if things don't happen the way that we want them to happen, it's not that he's forgotten about us. We don't get lost in his system, right? This is a guy who named all the stars. Do you think he forgot about you? Yours and my name? Like, no, of course he didn't. And so the message is to wait on the Lord. And if you'll be patient with him, he'll be able to take care of what these issues are that we have. And and that's such a wonderful thought, right? But the beginning, we left this thought that the Lord is very gentle and patient with us, right? That he knows what's going on and he's patient with us and gives us room to grow. Well, if God's going to be patient with me, can I not be patient with him? I think it should be obvious that I should be able to be patient with him. And let me just finally say this one thought. That concept of waiting on the Lord, I do not think it means sitting in a chair and literally just sitting there and waiting for God to do something. I think what the message of Isaiah is here is to stick with the Lord. That whatever's going on, whatever you're dealing with, if you will just stick with the Lord, things will turn out okay. And that's the message of Isaiah 40. I know that when we do announcements, uh, especially on Sunday mornings, sometimes they get very long. And there's so many people here dealing with sickness. There's so many people dealing with loss of life. There's also a lot of things I know that we don't announce. You know, whether we're embarrassed by them, maybe we just don't have time to announce them. But there's all little crises I think we're all dealing with at some point. Well, even in those things, if we would just stick with the Lord, He could renew our strength, couldn't he? What a wonderful thought that Isaiah gives us here in chapter 40. There's anyone here that needs to be in fellowship with God. We certainly want to spiritually assist you with that tonight. Some need the prayers of the congregation uh, to get back into the word of the Lord, which endures forever. Uh, Some of us may even need to obey the gospel because we know that the only way we'll be able to be eternal is if we have the gospel eternal on our side. There's anyone here we can spiritually assist. Why don't you come forward as we stand and sing?